Welcome everybody. Um, my name's Craig Hunter and I'm the Director of Government Engagement for Clear Dynamics and I'd like to welcome you to our first Startup Central Victoria event. It's wonderful to have you all here. Um, to open up, I'd like to do the acknowledgement of country and just to say that we acknowledge the Jojo Rung people as the traditional owners of this land and we pay our respects to the elders past and present. Um, I'm just also welcoming you here from Clear Dynamics. It's um, really exciting for Clear Dynamics to get the opportunity to be the lead agent for Startup, the Startup Central Victoria's new life and its, it's uh, iteration version two. Um, it's really exciting for us to be able to encourage the startup ecosystem within Central Victoria and be able to be part of this journey. Um, and you know we consider it a privilege not just to be able to host this event but also to be able to provide a leadership role within our community to be able to foster not just the um, digital startups but the broader startup community as well. Um, startup Central Victoria in its new iteration has got a focus on digital but we all acknowledge that digital is part of every uh, company's journey and so that we can provide that leadership and guidance because as a, a Central Victorian startup, Clear Dynamics has quite a lot of experience travelling that digital journey and so we see the opportunity to be able to provide uh, mentorship and guidance in that area. But we see that also that's relevant for any company in the startup community within our region. So we're really excited about being able to provide this mentorship role uh, in the ecosystem of startups and you know progressing into scale ups. And as this is our first event, um, you know we thought it'd be appropriate that we hold the event here at Clear Dynamics headquarters in Bendigo. Uh, so for all of you that are, are watching online, uh, I'd like to welcome you as well. And um, unfortunately, you haven't been able to experience our our office but um, hopefully in the future you will be able to. And um, we also have the privilege of having Jenny here. Um, and you know, Jenny is, is an a integral part of our leadership team in our executive group at Clear Dynamics, and she's gonna be uh, hosting the evening. And of course, Reggie, who she's gonna be interviewing. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, ask you to put your hands together to welcome Jenny and Reggie. Uh, to our launch event for Clear Dynamics and Central Startup Central Vic. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> so I am really looking forward to this next hour together. I had a chance to have a quick chat with Reggie uh, a few, a few, or late, late last week, um, and we got into a conversation, and it was so fascinating that at one point my other colleague had to cut in and say, "Now, now, now, come on, we have to get on with the matter of the day. Let's get this sorted." So. There's going to be a lot that you have to share with us today and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about you and your journey and, and Club Media and we're really going to be focusing a lot on what it takes to, really, to, to set up and run a successful remote startup, which has been um, your, your latest journey yeah. as an entrepreneur. Uh, but sometimes understanding why you're sitting here today um, warrants going back a little bit into history. So yeah. perhaps share with us a little bit of your journey as an entrepreneur and what brings you to this seat today? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks to Clear Dynamics. And You're not on. Oh. oh. Uh, Let's try that again. How's that? Cool. Um, I'll probably start by saying I did a music tech course. <laughs> so <laughs> fortunately, I know where the mute button is on this, so it's come in pretty handy. Um, but yeah, no, before I start, I want to say thanks to Clear Dynamics and for um, Startup Central Vic for inviting me, for me to be here. It's my second time in Bendigo, and it's just such an amazing place, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Um, so yeah, to wind back the years a little bit, <clears throat> um, maybe a good place to start is uh, just after I'd finished at the Conservatorium of Music in Brisbane. I studied music tech, as I just mentioned, and I got a job offer in Shanghai. This is in 2006. Um, and without putting too much thought into it, I kind of just like hurtled my way over to China. Didn't really know what I was getting myself into. And I was expecting to sort of be working at a, at a music studio as a sound engineer for just a few months. 
Uh, it turns out I'd end up staying in China for 13 years, um, a little longer than I anticipated. But when I got there, I was working um, predominantly as a music producer and sound engineer, working really long days and long weeks, um, and really didn't have any sort of social life. And it wasn't until about after a year that I'd been there, I started going out for the first time in China, in Shanghai. And this is a city of 20, 20 million people, which is the same, roughly the same population of Australia. And I realized there was just no music culture. And having, having grown up in Australia, I was used to going to festivals and gigs every weekend. And I was like, well, maybe this is something that I can contribute to this community, which I've started you know, immersing myself into. And so few, me and a few friends decided to create this event. And from that, it turned into uh, a regular event that we would bring in bands and DJs from around China, underground artists, and then eventually we started bringing in bands and DJs and musicians from all over the world. And before long, I had my own promotions company, and that was really my sort of first venture into being an entrepreneur, and it really just started off because I wanted to listen to more music <laughs> and go to more gigs. Um, but I also think I identified pretty early on that there was a, a gap, and I was trying to sort of fulfill that gap. From there, I turned my uh, company into a creative agency, and before long, by 2012 and 2013, I'd opened my first bar in 2012 called Arcade, which is a video game themed cocktail lounge where you can listen to DJs and play old school video games. And then in 2013, I opened my first underground club called Arkham. And that was a really big moment for me because I'd been wanting to open a club for years. It was also a young dream of mine when I was a young kid. And so I managed to do that in Shanghai with this community that I helped develop. And it was a really beautiful and uh, yeah, just an incredible feeling to be able to pass through that, I guess. <clears throat> so by this point, I was completely burnt out, uh, running a club, running a bar, running a promotions company, partying way too hard. And by 2016, I decided to switch gears and I got hit up by a company at a time that were pretty young called 88 Rising. And they were very aligned with my ideals in championing Asian youth culture and Asian creatives. And so I joined them as a general manager and creative director and decided to sort of depart from my role in nightlife entertainment uh, over the next 12 months or so. And at 88, that really gave me a, a taste of video production, uh, running a record label, create a creative agency that was working with some really, really big brands on more video content. Um, and I did that for three years and felt like I hit a little bit of a ceiling and my time at China was sort of coming to an end. And so I set up Club Media, which is my latest company. Uh, sorry, I left 88 Rising, left China and set up my, my, my most recent company called Club Media. And that's really sort of taking on the work that I was doing at 88, but moving it with emerging tech. And that was something that was just always a fascination for me. And so with Club Media, we set that up in 2020. Um, and my co-founder and I set it up thinking that, hey, why don't we set up a company where we can work from anywhere in the world? And this is maybe a little bit uh, kind of thinking ahead, not that we'd known at the time, but we wanted to travel around the world. And we both had this idea of that we could both be digital nomads, company owners, and travel around the world and set this company up. So that's what we did. We set it up in Hong Kong and China. And then literally a month later, the whole world was turned upside down. And our company, which we had already planned to be remote, was definitely remote at this point. I flew back to Australia to be with my family. And then the next, over the next three years, we learned and taught ourselves how to make a remote company, which was uh, an incredible journey yeah. and almost forced upon us. But at the same time, it worked so well for us because we were, a, we were making digital content, whether it's music, uh, even sometimes with video productions or animations. Um, at the same time, kind of combining that with our love for blockchain, digital avatars, metaverse, et cetera. It's a big switch, though. You've gone from mm. physical events, events, bars, underground, you know, you've gone physical to this remote option in club mm. media. You've explained why you wanted to do it. What are some of the things that you needed to adjust pretty quickly if you were going to make a remote startup successful? Yeah, I think the first thing is figuring out how our team was going to work together. Yeah. Um, so, and also how we're going to operate as a business. So Club Media was always set up as a, as a production agency, as a creative production agency. So how do we connect with our clients? Um, how then do we create teams to deliver 
the deliverables that we need to deliver, and then internally, how do we communicate with one another so we're all on track and we're all kind of moving, um, moving the needle forward. And so we had a team um, that was based in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Perth. I was in Melbourne. We had clients in New Zealand, in Shanghai, um, and we were also outsourcing with teams to Argentina and other parts of Asia. So it felt like we were running the United Nations, yeah. basically, at that point. <laughs> but it was, it was super challenging, but then I, we kind of tried to figure out very early on, what are the things that this scenario can, what can we benefit from? And one of the things we figured out very early is that we can work around the clock. Yeah. So when things are happening in Shanghai and Australia time, when we clock off, then maybe people from LA, New York, uh, or UK can pick up. So we were like finding a remote team that could sort of facilitate that. And that's the other second good thing about a remote setup is you have access to global talent, yeah. um, which is uh, a, a huge positive and a huge plus because it allows you to really flex your network um, and to work with some amazing people from all over the world. So, yeah. And, and look, I mean, COVID, COVID forced a lot of organisations. I mean, you had kind of um, put yourself in a winning position coming into COVID, but COVID caused a lot of organisations to have to think about what remote meant. Coming out the other... And, and you probably, therefore, had a natural benefit for a little while there, but coming out the other mm. side, you know, how, how, do, how do customers respond to you wanting to be that remote particularly if they were used to a physical interaction with a creative agency. How did they, how, how did you have to help them adjust? Yeah, so a lot of our customers or clients were uh, based in China. They were, they were kind of clients that we had accumulated over time. But then our new clients in, in other parts of the world, um, I think that when COVID had sort of started to wind down a little bit, they kind of went back to working with teams that were closer to them. But when we were kind of, um, I guess, emerging throughout COVID, we were kind of working with whomever. So I think COVID sort of almost put the curtains back up a little bit to a degree, and they were more comfortable to work with people in their time zones. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's a, a huge barrier, was sometimes, although you can sort of tag your team in, your remote team from another part of the world, and work around the clock, it was also really exhausting to do things um, in these sort of bursts of meetings where, you know, before that we would sit in a room and work with a whiteboard and it just felt, I don't know, it felt less tiresome at the time. And I think there was this sort of exhaustion through COVID where a lot of teams were wanting to go back into physical meeting rooms uh, and whiteboards and work in that, in that way again. And you, when you mentioned emerging technology, from a remote perspective, what types, what types of technologies have you explored with? I mean, you're in a very creative environment. Club Media is, by virtue, creative. Mm -hmm. What types of technologies have you found have really helped that kind of remote working um, environment, um, as well as just getting your own stuff done? Yeah, a lot of the work that we do is um, stuff we find fun. <laughs> uh, we're kind of childlike at heart, and so we it's, it's what is what we find fun and what we find fascinating. And so uh, very early on, we were looking at working with digital avatars. So this is the idea of creating a photorealistic human being and creating content for them that rolls out on Instagram, but they're not even a real person. They're just the CG character. Uh, and what does that mean? And how will people respond to it? Pretty experimental. And um, we found out very quickly that brands loved it and a lot of the clients that we were working with we were very excited that all of a sudden you could almost create this you know, person and do whatever you want sort of thing in terms of the content they created. Um, so looking at things like that, but then also looking at things like making uh, music NFTs. Uh, we did some also other music, uh, other NFTs on, on, on places like Super Rare. Everything that we were working on was really in, in this digital realm. And I think part of it was kind of accelerated because of COVID. Like we were uh, pr predominantly before like a creative agency um, model. Yeah. And now we were sort of like just surfing the kind of vibe of the whole world, which is moving into these more digital spaces, whether that's gaming or virtual avatars or blockchain, we were trying to sort of shift and accommodate that shift as well. And from a staff perspective, you said you had up to about 15 that you recruited over that. Um, 
You know, we were talking earlier, and, and one of our, one of the colleagues said, "Oh, yeah, you have to be a little bit careful how you hire, because some people hire well into remote working environments. Some people struggle a little bit more with it." Did did you find? And, and you're right, global talent is a massive win when you go remote. Um, did you find that that you were actually attracting better talent than you might have if you had had more of a physical kind of um, DNA, I guess, to the business? And, and or were there some challenges in that, in terms of bringing teams together and actually creating a sense of culture in the business? Yeah, so I think that the way that we worked was quite hybrid. We had a nucleus team yeah. um, that sort of worked full time. Then we almost had like a extended part time team. And then we had uh, almost- Extended family. <laughs> exactly, extended family. <laughs> and then we had our um, almost um, for like for hire workers and your more casual or contract workers. Um, because we worked in a lot of productions, um, you know, they're finite, they work, yep. you know, they work for sometimes three to six months and then finish it. So we just sort of set the company up so we can inflate and deflate as, as needed. But at the heart of it, we had this, it was still remote, this remote full-time team. And in order for that to really function and hum, um, we needed to allow our, those team members uh, autonomy for what they did um, and allow them to manage other teams, especially when we uh, inflate into working on big productions, to be able to get their work done. And we didn't want to like hover over them or tell them when they needed to check in and check out for work. It's like, this is what we need to get done. Do your best job to get it done and then let's just check in as we go through. And I think that level of agency and trust and, and, and autonomy um, created such a, a good, healthy culture because if they needed to go out and go for a walk in the park, like, I don't need to know about it. I hope they go do it, and they should. Um, but it allowed them to manage their own schedules and their own time. And we hired the people that we were confident that could manage that themselves. Um, so their own level of you know, intelligence and management, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, what about practical technologies? I mean, we all know the teams and we know this. Like, collaboration mm -hmm. becomes critical and communication. And even when you say tap in, tap out, if you're not communicating really well at that moment when you're tapping, mm. you could end up just having a whole lot of people not knowing what they're about to... So just practical technologies around how to make that work really well. Did you explore some stuff that worked, didn't work, yep. things that surprised you that you hadn't thought would work, you know? How have, have, you, have you made it hum? I think um, we had to rely heavily on digital tools to manage us. Um, we were all digital natives, so we we're familiar with a lot of software and, and, and things. So we knew that side pretty well. But then it was finding the software that worked for us. Um, so as an example, one of my first go-to things is Notion. Um, it's one of my favorite tools. I love going on there. and. Um, I can just spit out what I'm thinking very quickly. Uh, I've also started adopting things like Figma, um, yep. you know, especially when, when working with, des with designers or, again, mood boarding things um, as a team as well, whiteboarding things. Funnily enough, my sort of go-to for anything was Keynote. Um, oh, really? Yeah, so a lot of the work that I do is a, was a creative director. Yes. So I have to communicate things to people, and it's very image or content heavy. Yeah. So Keynote was just like an extension of me, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was able to just whip up ideas, whip up things, and present them in a communicable way um, very quickly on Keynote. But when working with others, not everybody has a Mac, and you can get fumbly when, you, when it's not. So we started looking at looking at, uh, yeah, things like Figma or mirror boards, and, et cetera. And you, know, you mentioned the autonomy, which also means you're kind of thinking about an outcome, and you're looking for the outcome and then people are really given the space to, to yeah. get to that. What did that do for you in terms of how you thought about measuring the success of the business differently? Did, did you have to think differently about measurements of success or any, anything in that regard? Yeah, I think in terms of like, you know, like KPIs or things like that, I mean, a lot of the stuff we do is, so, is quite creative and the KPIs usually comes from the client. Right. <laughs> and if, if, if they're getting the right sort of engagement or if they're re reaching the right target audience that the content is made for. So we'll usually hear a little bit from them. Um, and then from our side, I think 
we have our own in, internal levels of quality that we want to achieve, and those bars are set quite high because we don't want to look like a company that's just from Shanghai or from Melbourne. We want to look like a global agency that makes top, top quality content. And so we had very, very um, high standards internally, and we worked with people that also kept those high standards as well when they worked with us. Um, so that was probably maybe the closest, I guess, in terms of KPI, but then the other KPIs really came from uh, the clients. Client. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but what about you personally? Did you have to change any of your behavioural patterns, how you normally would engage or lead teams, lead a business? Did anything kind of, did you, did you notice having to adapt as an individual in any way? Um, good question. I haven't had, had too much time to reflect on it. I think before when I was running companies, before we went remote, I always allowed that level of autonomy yep. to all my staff. So I never told them what time they need to be in. But if we have a meeting, I expect them to be there. But usually, we wouldn't do meetings until like after 11, for example. Again, this is because of my industry. I worked with youth, youth culture, events, and et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of gave that leniency, and I gave them that um, autonomy. And a lot of my team, especially when I was at 88 Rising, um, I hired everyone that was basically under 27, um, yeah. purely because we were making youth culture content for Asia and China. So I wanted to hire very young, and I think Again, I just hired smart kids that just had a drive, that knew, that were hungry but still humble. And um, the rest, you know, you can coach them um, just as you would any kind of company atmosphere and culture. But then allow them to do their thing and, uh, you know, have an open door if they need help. Uh, if I can't answer it, I'll try and bring someone in, else in that can and sort of mentor them through that process. So by the time they leave, they have not just provided a lot of quality contribution to the company, but hopefully the company's offered them a lot as well in terms of upskilling and learning and things. It's kind of learning through coaching as opposed to anything that's more structured or process driven. Yeah, it, I mean, it worked for... You will get to this by this stage and you will have you know, had this, this many training, yeah. So you've gone more fluid with the learning process. Yeah, and I think also the teams that I were running weren't, weren't massive. They weren't like over 20 people, so I could have a little bit more of a bond ask them what they're into, like what they're interested in, be like, oh, cool, you should maybe meet this person. They're also doing that. And just try and create a system of harmony within the team. Um, and there, there would be times where, again, like I don't tell them how long they should stay, but we might have to make a presentation that goes to the client the day after. And I'm doing it by myself. And I'm like, if anybody wants to help me, please help me. <laughs> um, I'll buy pizza and some wine. And then literally the whole team will just stay with me until 1 AM, and we'll get it done together. I'm like, please don't come in to, yeah. until after lunch tomorrow. And then there's, this, simil there's this, this feeling of accomplishment that we've done something together and we've gone through something together. And especially the wins, you know, they feel stronger when you, when you win a big contract or you do an amazing job and it gets a billion views or whatever. But then you also have to eat dirt together. And it's a lot easier to eat dirt with someone when you're close to them because yeah. you feel like, hey, we could power through this together, as opposed to pointing fingers and things like that. And so look, there's got to be some things that you tried that didn't work, or some things that you do find are hard by being remote, and, and you know, you're having to manage that. What, what are those things? So I, the first one that comes to mind is that whole thing I just mentioned about sort of creating a bond yep. with my staff, and I, it's very hard to do that remotely. Um, you know, things that a remote team experiences is usually pockets of time and meetings together on a screen, and then after that, it just shuts off. Whereas in an office, you can, you know, just have a chat with someone, like water cooler sort of stuff, but then also maybe after work, let's go get a beer, let's go get a drink, or let's chat a little bit more about something that we're working on, or what are you working on outside of work, let's talk about that. I feel like that was very hard to sort of facilitate and inspire. Um, so that's one, is just creating that company, company culture and, and employee sort of bond and spirit. Two is meetings around the clock. <laughs> um, and at first, you're like, cool, I, I can handle this. There's meetings in the morning. There's meetings in the evening. I'll figure it out. But then after time, that can wear you down. And there is definitely exhaustion that comes in when you're working with teams from the UK to South America. Um, 
you don't turn off. And you, at some points, you're just like, where do I find time to sleep? Or where do I find time to get things done? So managing that process um, maybe is one of the things I learned when you asked yeah. me earlier. Um, it, it's like trying to figure out how to best manage my schedule. Because I was kind of in startup mode. I just said yes to any meeting. Yeah. And I just kind of threw myself at everything. But I think in hindsight, it would be better to pick the days that I do certain things a bit, a bit more wisely. Yeah. yeah. And for you and your business partner, um, I mean, we talked earlier about some organisations that have come from more of a very physical culture and they grew up that way and that's the way the business operated and then, you know, how do you take that virtual? Um, and there are sometimes some trust issues that go on in that environment. Um, did you find trust, ironically enough, easier to build in a remote construct amongst yourself, your business partner, your staff? Mm. I'm not sure if it's if it was easier or not or, or better or not, but it was a must. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. almost like you have to trust people to get stuff done. Um, in order for, for the company or the team to get through, jump through the hoops and accomplish their milestones, like we have to trust each other to do stuff. And I think this goes back to um, hiring the right people that can be autonomous and can self-manage, but it also work as part of a team um, and trying to instill very early on what what's required. Um, yeah, I don't yeah. know if that answers. No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. So we might open it up to the floor if anyone has, or, and online, if anyone has any questions. Um, as you've been sitting here listening to Reggie. Yeah, So, 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 I'm interested to know. Um, also, what sort of a routine or like a rituals that like you usually have like to improve like the the bond or camaraderie between your remote team? Yeah, like a routine of activities that you normally do. Um, the, yeah, I think one. We just had our group chats and our memes. <laughs> so like, we kind of kept it pretty friendly within our group chats. Like, it wasn't always work, work, work. It was, we'd also just share things that we would come across an online culture or whatever. Um, so just making sure that there was space and room for us to be humans and not just employees or working on a project um, it was one thing. And then the other thing is once in a while we'll do like show and tells, like virtual show and tells. Just bring something and talk about it. And I think that just helps, especially with new people that are joining the team, sort of break the ice because we don't have that, again, familiarity in the workplace um, that you would have uh, in a more traditional environment. So we had to find ways to break ice and uh, make things comfortable for others. So memes and show and tell were the two ones that come to, come to my mind specifically. And what about with your customers or your clients? Did you have any rituals that helped you facilitate that connection and rapport? No, I didn't want to get close to them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, They're uh, just the customer. <laughs> oh, I worry about them. No, no, I'm joking. Um, I think a, um, a lot of it was, a lot of the projects that we were on, they were very, very intense. And so um, it was very clinical if I can say that, the way that we worked was very, very clinical. And they were also juggling a lot of, like the clients that, clients that I had were also juggling a number of other things. So we had to kind of go in and out, just punch in, punch out, and just keep it very concise, very directed, uh, and make sure like, OK, this is, it. Like, this is the update. This is happening. This is the next step. We're going to do this. We'll fix that. And they're like, cool. And they're out. So it was kind of very, it was intense. It was very um, dry. There wasn't much room to build rapport or things. Um, and I think it was just the nature of COVID. People were dealing with a lot of things. Companies were dealing with a lot of things. Yeah. With how they were managing their marketing spends to their internal teams to dealing with everything from like just ha you know even having a place to come work at. Yeah. So I think. Because of that, our communications with them were streamlined to almost like um, a ne like whatever's a necessity, if I could say yeah, that. Yeah, fascinating. It's kind of not what I would have expected the answer to be, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, any other questions? Yeah, sure. oh. on, on this side, I'll come. <laughs> uh, you mentioned your team grew small to large as required. <laughs> um, just for context, what kind of sizes were those? And did you create some kind of onboarding process 
for when you did have to grow your team so to help the speed up that process? Yeah, um, great question. A lot of the work that we were doing, it would sometimes, with, with video production, for example, and so uh, we did a lot of music videos in China, and our teams for the video production could be in the hundreds. Um, if, if you take in extras and stuff, but generally, like, yeah, we'd go up to 100, 150, and then sometimes we're working on multiple projects. So, um, fortunately, we had experience with video production, so we knew a lot of these people that, and, like, directors or DOPs or producers that we were working with. So, there was already a familiarity. We had to lean into that, especially in COVID. We had to work with what we knew, so there wasn't too many points of disruption that we couldn't foresee or solve. So we tried to keep it very lean and keep it very measured with the kind of the people that we work with. Um, and in terms of like the hiring process coming in, it really just came down to, as I mentioned before, like being able to trust that they can get the work done, um, that they can work together as a team and then fight for one another. But at the same time, if they need to go out and solve problems, they can do it. Um, they were very, very key. And then also... Um, How did you filter for that? In terms of... Well, Which, you know, in a standard, how are you filtering for, I think this well, person's going to just be a self, self-driven, self autonomous, but able to build, blend in with team? There's a lot going on in those few words. Yeah. Did, how did you even interview for that? Well, I think a lot of a lot of people are interested in jobs where they don't have to clock in nine to five. Yeah. So that's one thing. And it's like, well, if I'm going to give you that freedom where you don't have to clock in, then you have to be able to be an outcome-driven member of the team. Um, and... Yeah, we, at the beginning of the hiring process, we can have tasks on how to problems, mainly problem solving. Can you solve this particular problem by yourself? If not, how would you go about solving it? And I think those characteristics start to appear on, 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 on how you can lean into a team or ask the right questions or is this something that you can do by yourself? And if so, how would you go about doing it? Um, yeah, so kind of a blend of that and then just sitting down with a person and kind of having a chat. Oh, the other thing is um, referrals. Yeah. So uh, that's a big one. So people would refer um, members to us or to me or my, my co-founder. And if they had worked in a company of someone that I knew that worked there or had worked for them or et cetera, it went a long way into vet that vetting process as well. Yeah. yeah. Over here. Hello, Reggie. Rob, hey. Rob from B Bendigo. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, identifying gaps in the market or, um, or uh, finding out uh, an initiative was really popular. Um, have you got a, a process or a framework uh, that you work to or some guiding principles in terms of how, how you have more potentially hits than misses in that, in that journey? Uh, I wish I could tell you that I did. <laughs> Um, but I think a lot of it, like I follow this kind of ideology of blue oceans where you try and move into a startup where there's less resistance for you to succeed. So by that, maybe there's less competitors or maybe it's a resource that you have access to um, that gives you a greater advantage. Uh, but the blue ocean theory, I think, generally, if I look back at my life, is kind of without even really knowing, it was, was, it was what was resonating with me. So when I started my first events company, it was because there was no other events company doing what I was doing. And so therefore, there was a blue ocean. Um, when I opened my first bar, all the bars in Shanghai, you could get really good cocktails, or you could go to a really underground place and listen to cool music, but there was nowhere in between. So again, I felt like that was a blue ocean. Um, and so I've always maybe... I'm not sure if it was just instinct or something, but I was always sort of driven into filling those gaps. And those gaps that I found were just things that I would see that no one was fixing. <laughs> so I almost just took it upon myself to be like, all right, if no one else is going to do this, I may as well try. Um, and then after that, it's really about surrounding myself with people that can help me get it done. Yeah. Ultimately. And there's a lot of passion there. Of course. You're passionate it's all about, about the my subject, passions. you know, yeah. and, and potentially you're seeing the gap more because you're so passionate about what you would like to be experiencing for yourself, maybe. Yeah, I think there's definitely different ways to start a startup. You can do it and just be like, cool, I just want to turn a dollar, and here's an opportunity, and I can solve this problem with something, and I'm just going to solve it. I think for me, it came from a very different place. It was, it was about who I, who I wanted to fight for. 
um, and the people I wanted to work with. Uh, like who's going to get me up in the morning that I want to support or who I want to fight for. And that really was my kind of North Star in a lot of the work that I've done in the past. Yeah. Amazing. We've got an online question, I think. Oh, cool. We have two, two online questions. And I might start with the second one first because I think it follows on nicely. Um, great creative is normally rooted in insight or customer needs. How do you go about uncovering it with remote teams? Who facilitated that research? Hmm. So I think, um, I think there's a few different ways to look at the research. Obviously, you can go out and literally conduct the research as a research project. Um, the other one is that I've found works the best is just talking to a lot of people yeah. <laughs> in the area that you're trying to work within. So for example, in my first company, when I started doing events, um, there was just no, there was just nowhere to go hang out and listen to cool music. And everyone said this. Everyone that I would talk to would be like, Shanghai's great, Shanghai's such a cool city, but there's just like no bar that I can go listen to like the presets or I can listen to Metallica, whatever it is. And everyone was saying this and I was like, why don't you just make somewhere where people can get together and listen to it? And the first gig that we did, uh, it was in a small venue of like 100 people, but then there was about 300 people outside the venue that couldn't get in. And this was a huge indicator that, hey, we're solving a problem. Um, and it wasn't solved by in-depth qualitative and quantitative measures. It was done because we're just listening to the people. A bit like anthropology. Yeah. In, in an odd way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And the next one? And the other one relates back to what you said earlier when you were talking about your company, you didn't want it relating just to Shanghai or just to Melbourne. Mm. So in terms of setting up a global image for your company, what steps would you, do you think are crucial to do that? That's a really good question. Um, I think the way that we wanted to stand out as a global company was really the kind of content, like the quality of content and the clients that we were working with. I'm not really sure if there's like a shortcut way to make your company look international or look global. Um, but we did it through the clients that we were attracting. So they came from all over the world. Some clients as I mentioned from New Zealand, yeah. from China, from Germany, Australia. The second was with the, the collaborative creatives that we were working with. So whether it's a designer or a director or an artist, they came from all over the world. So we really just tried to be as global in how we operated. And maybe that facilitated a more global image. Um, and we enjoyed that. You know, we wanted to be a company that didn't feel like it was from anywhere, but it was taking the best of a little bit of everywhere. So did you overtly brand? Did you overtly take yourself to market? Or was this really a network effect of relationships, yeah. past relationships existing as you recruited in, word of mouth from existing clients? like? What did that look like in, in, a, in a remote context? So when we set up Club Media, it was, the idea was to create a creative production agency to serve our clients in China. Um, but as I mentioned, within a month, we got hit by COVID. Um, and then at that point, it was like, well, I guess we can't just focus on China because one, they were just getting hammered by COVID in the early days, so we had to look elsewhere. Um, and at that point, it was just, like going out and just cold calling people like, hey, not just cold calling, but also just trying to um, reinvigorate old conversations uh, with p potential clients, etc. And because we worked in video production, animation, etc., and this whole metaverse thing was starting to bubble up, we're like, maybe we can leverage that, started up, you know, working in those spaces. We had to be very agile. At the same time, in China, keeping an eye on everything is going to make sure that we can still cultivate our clientele over there. Yeah. And we were, and basically my founder, my co-founder was in um, Shanghai, I was in Melbourne, and we were able to do both. So he was really focusing on the Chinese domestic market, and I was focusing on expanding it to make club media more international by finding those collaborators and clients. Interesting. It's interesting that whole adapt. At some point you, you're kind of adapting and then you realise you're adapting and then you make a conscious choice to do it or not do it. Mm -hmm. um, did you and your business partner find you were adapting in ways where you went, hold on, we're not sure whether that's really we want to, where we really want to be going and we're kind of just being... Always. Yeah. Yeah, okay. because we're also doing a lot of things that not, 
normal companies really do. Like a normal company doesn't just make a digital human and yeah. try to release yeah. it on social media. So we wanted to experiment. I think that was in our DNA. We wanted to do things that other people weren't doing because we wanted to learn and just see how people react. And yeah. um, from those learnings, is there ways that we can then take something from that and maybe repackage it as a product or a service to our clients? Um, so there was definitely that thinking. But it's not like all. It R was it experimental R&D. Yeah, yeah. It, it really was, and I think you know, even with the, just the digital avatars, learned so much from that that it's now starting to play such an important factor for like a new company that I'm looking at setting up now, which is around digital avatars, and I think experimentation, especially in emerging tech, is so critical. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I can't say that enough, is collaborate and experiment and try and find out where the edges are yep. and see if you can go beyond them, basically. Yeah, yep. Any other questions from the floor? Really interesting, in interesting chat today. Um, you've mentioned a lot around emerging technology and balancing innovation, but also the project management of having multiple clients to deliver to simultaneously. How do you balance that, you know, day in, day out of delivering projects with the emerging technology and the innovation and identifying where is a good opportunity for you to push the edges and where is one for you to deliver tried and true methodology for this client? Um, so a lot of the R&D that we've done in the past, like we haven't done specifically like a lot of qualitative and quantitative. A lot of that work is usually done either by our clients or an agency that they work with. Um, with that being said, you know, I'm actually looking to try and conduct some more aren't like quantitative and qualitative research measures this year around digital avatars actually um, and their association with marginalized communities and, and online behaviors. Um, but then a lot of it also comes down to trying to lead, <laughs> read tea leaves a little bit. Um, and what I, what I mean by that is trying to get a macro understanding of emerging tech and what are the main players and what is everyone talking about and what are the companies that can have the most influence in these sectors, what are they moving towards? And then trying to kind of connect those dots a little bit. Um, so whether, you know, recently we've seen so much movement in AI, there's heaps of stuff happening in the AR space, we're waiting for Apple's, you know, glasses to come out, there's also stuff happening with electric cars, etc. If you can start mapping out some of these landscapes and then speak to people that work at the intersections of, the, of them, you can start seeing patterns emerge or trends that might start appearing. Um, and then from there, from our side, we're like, okay, we just learned something about NFTs. Okay, well, what that could, what could that be for, you know, Chinese hip hop band that we're working with? Well, maybe that's something that we can pair together, or this, you know, something else with AI. For us, it was trying to map a constellation with the things that we are fascinated and love, the clients that we work with, the partners that we work with, and seeing if there's something where we're kind of the glue that sticks it together, and then an outcome comes out of it. Uh, the commercialization of some of those things because it's easy to fall into the trap of I'll commercialize that the way I earn money today mm. versus I'll try and commercialize that quite differently and, and how much do you push the envelope on that as well as you're thinking about those intersections and as you start to trial that with some of your customers um, how much do you think about what are the options here and how I, I might commercialize this differently or do you let that kind of eke out as you test and trial I think a lot of the commercialization or monetization with the way that club media operated was very much predominantly an agency model. Yes. Right. So we got paid to do work, you know. And so, um, however, with the R and D stuff, the, like digital avatars and things, that was our budget that we were sort of putting towards it to prove a thesis. So, for example, um, could we create a digital human um, that, even with less than 1,000 followers or 500 followers that will get picked up by major brands to appear in their commercials. Right. Right. And so, and if that's the case, then we can take that model and take it to other brands and and then figure yeah. out and then figure out what our what our service model is yeah. based on that. So, 
Um, answer that is you can. <laughs> um, and we, we learned that and we were like, hey, the demand is not about how many followers they, ha they have, but it's in how novel of an idea it is and how you could potentially um, resonate, especially with a young Gen Z audience that is so familiar with digital beings and digital characters in their d daily life. Um, so we would try and take some of those insights, um, take that to brands, and then based on what they're willing to pay for it, et cetera, we can start building out a rate card or a services model that we can take to other clients, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Any more online? No? I, while the one's online, uh, thinking of their next question, uh, something that's just occurring to me, um, we're here in Clear Dynamics who are obviously being a great supporter of encouraging conversations um, to inspire and support startups. What do you, and, and we've got a number of other ecosystem builders in the room, you've already heard Rob ask a question. What can we do, you as an entrepreneur coming through the ranks, you know, uh, tech new ideas, what would you suggest to the ecosystem players that they can do to help Here? aspiring anywhere in regional mm. Victoria? Well, that's our, what we're talking about now, but how can we support um, businesses like yourselves to get started? So, I think um, as an entrepreneur that works predominantly in digital, um, I can take a lot of the work that I do anywhere I go. So in a, in a few weeks, I'm going to be going to Bali to spend some time there and, and work on a new startup. Um, I love traveling to places and immersing myself in culture and meeting the people of that city or town or wherever it is. And I think one thing that I would love to see, particularly here in Bendigo or other parts of regional Vic, is creating these hubs that foster um, entrepreneurship and collaboration and maybe even almost like how you have an artist residence, mm -hmm. maybe an entrepreneur residence, yeah. or something like that where people can come. Could be whatever, could be a creative startup, it could be a, you know, whatever startup, but they're gonna be able to share knowledge with the local community and upskill them on something that they're working on, maybe present how they're working on it, um, and maybe have this revolving door of people coming and bringing knowledge, but then at the same time, you're able to provide this beautiful town with amazing, you know, like um, hospitality and, and weather today, um, especially when you're UNESCO, I think, was it gastronomy, I think? Um, yes. Something like yes. that, right? Yes, uh, in, here in Bendigo. So there's so much that whole region, right, has so much to offer the rest of the world. Um, so I think it'd be great to just invite people to just share this beautiful place, give them high-speed high internet, and they'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Mount Martha, and we have a problem with the high-speed oh, internet right. down how, there. How is so the internet here? Is it high-speed enough? Oh, OK. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're, waiting for, we, we're, waiting for, uh, we're waiting for Starlink to get Starlink. up. Right. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, you know, even if it's not the fastest internet in the world, I lived, you know, in China. It wasn't the greatest time. Though. But I think it's about having an opportunity for yeah, people to come and gather and collaborate, create these networks, create these support systems. Um, and then also the local communities getting involved and in collaborating, participating, engaging with that hub. Um, and then that hub can you know, send the signal out to others yeah. and then more people will come. Yeah. Uh, but I would love to see that because my dream would totally be to live in regional Vic somewhere or regional Australia and then work on like creative startups with a community that's local and online as well. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Any, any other, yes, down the front here. Thank you for all the answers so far. Been great. Uh, so I have a question. You sure. said that a lot of your clients came from your original relationships. If you didn't have that and you were starting from scratch, what would your advice be for some of us who are starting from scratch? Like, uh, would you like us to lean heavily on content or mm. like podcasts, YouTube, um, blogs, or do paid advertising to capture um, clients fast? Like, mm. wh what um, route would you suggest we go? Yeah, I guess it depends on the business, but like, um, I think it's really important to grow your network very quickly, as quickly as you can. Like, you need to create your star map of people. I think at the end of the day, it's people that run businesses. It's also people that service businesses and are paying customers. Um, 
So you need to figure out the whole people thing <laughs> very early on, and then figuring out, okay, um, so in, in my case, I had been building up a, uh, a network of clients throughout my career, which by the time I had my own company with Club Media, I was able to sort of activate some of those contacts. Um, and similarly, I think it's finding who your people are. So one is, who are your consumers? Who are you fighting for? Um, if we go back to my analogy, who, what, who are the people that you want to get up for every day and fight for? And then it's like, okay, well, who are the people that you can surround yourself with that bring something to the table that you don't? So figure out your weaknesses, what you're bad at, um, and what you're good at, obviously, as well, and then find the people that can sort of fill those gaps. Um, and then find people that will support you when things get hairy. So you need to have that emotional like kind of support. And that can be family and friends, but also I find that I get a lot of inspiration from other entrepreneurs that are doing stuff and being in a group chat with them, like a WhatsApp chat, um, because I see them do well. And it makes me, encourages me to be like, hey, I can do this as well. And if I fail at something, I'll share it with them. And that might help them dodge a bullet. In the, and so if you have that little collection of friends that are entrepreneurs or kind of going through a similar journey to what you're doing, you can get somewhere faster and with less, and dodging less bullets because, sorry, dodging more bullets because you are informing one another um, of challenges. And so I think if you can create those networks, um, you have a good chance of, yeah, being able to, to get to where you want to get to quicker. Hi. Uh, another starting from scratch sort of question. Mm. Uh, just wanting your opinion on what you should bring to the table uh, when you're at the point of seeking investors. What you should bring to the table? Like how prepared, in your opinion, do you think you would be to set your best foot forward before seeking investment? Um, I, okay, so I've gone through the process of raising money before. So... If, um, one was through friends and family for the venues and early business. And then last year, I went through a round of looking to raise capital for club media, which I ended up just not going through with because it was, it was kind of like, it was just a time suck. Like, it, raising capital is, takes so much time and effort. Um, and we were also self-sufficient. Like, we didn't need the money at the time. So we decided not to sort of go down that route. But I think it's important to understand um, one, do you need to raise the money? Because it is a lot to take on, and it can be um, it can be a massive pain to get through. So one is like, do you need it? Can you do it without it? Is there a way for you to figure out a, uh, a system to do it without it? And then two, if you do need it, what is the best method for you, and who are the right people to go out and ask for? So when I say method, is it do you need to go to a VC? Can you do it with grants? Grant, you know, here in Australia, we're so lucky that we have an amazing grant system, um, especially in the creative industries with Victoria. They've supported me with grants in the past, and I think we're very, we're very lucky to be able to lean upon that. So, and plus, you don't have to give, give up any equity. So, also pretty viable, you know, solution. If you exhaust those ones, and you know, um, even like family and friends and, su and such, if that's something that you want to consider then yeah, your next thing is, all right, angels, VCs, et cetera. At that point, you need to, my, my thinking is you need to go into a meeting where they don't even have a chance to say no. <laughs> like that you have to go in with that confidence where it's a no-brainer when you sit down with them to the point where you're like, all right, I gotta go. Um, Cause I have 10 other people that are waiting for, to talk to me cause this is the best idea and this is gonna be a no-brainer. So if you go with that mentality, I think, um, that would be the advice that I would give. Like, don't go and underprepared. Go in as like, this is a no-brainer for anyone that comes to me. Yeah. Well, we are almost on time. Um, I'm going to ask the classic, what's the best last question to ask, Reggie, which is three takeaways. What are the three things? And let me ask another way. What are the three things you hold yourself to? <laughs> in the way you approach entrepreneurship, the three thing, you know, I mean, you've mentioned some of them, what yeah. do you get up to fight for, yeah. feels like one of them. Um, but just what are those three things that really keep you accountable to yourself? Um, yeah, so definitely the people. One, as I mentioned before, what, the people I fight for, the people I want to work with as well is really important. The people I want to grow with as a person. 
um, to people for me is, is critical. Um, I think also what's fun. <laughs> I know this sounds stupid yeah. and, and childish. <laughs> Go spend time doing like, it. But it's like we only have one life, and yeah. so we want to do things that we enjoy. Um, so the people obviously bring the first topic, obviously brings in a lot of that second part. But do things that you want to do. Do things that you enjoy. Um, don't do things because you th because someone's just telling you to, or that's what you, you think is expected of you, because I feel like that can get you into a bit of a bind. But if you find things that you enjoy, explore them, and then find other people that like doing it and explore it with them. And then I think even if nothing works out, um, you're going to learn something, and you're probably going to you know, make a great relationship out of it. Um, the third one. Context of remote. What would be one of those things you hold yourself to in the context of making remote work successfully? I mean, for me, it's really um, we think I, one is definitely finding people I haven't worked with before, finding ways to collaborate with people I haven't worked with or industries I haven't worked with. And this is just a person, totally personal thing. But I love learning stuff. I want to learn about. Um, for example, AI. You know, AI is something that's relatively new to me. I only started to get a learning about it last year. And of course, there's been a massive boom with AI in the last six months. Um, I don't call myself an AI expert by any means, but I love talking to people that are and just to learn. And then being like, hey, I wonder if you do this. And I know this one guy. And then maybe I can bring this to the table. And then like something spawns out of it. And to me, I get really excited about stuff like that, where yeah. it's just through organic conversation, resonating with someone, getting excited together about something, and being like, cool, how do we make this happen? Um, and so I don't know if that's an answer or not, but that's, <laughs> that's what I'm going to go with. Yeah. A lot of passion. If I were to round up <laughs> Reggie in one word, it would be passionate. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. and spending your time with us here today, and, and to all of you also um, for spending you know, an hour or so this, up, this evening with us and for the questions. For those that are online, thank you also. It's been great to have you participate. Thank you. It has been wonderful. Thank you, Reggie. And listening to your story, you've got all the attributes of an entrepreneur and that inquisitive nature, seeing the gaps, <laughs> having a go, testing things. And um, I just love your, um, your, your philosophy in life. And it's been delightful to have you here this been evening. A pleasure. And lovely to have people online, lovely to have people here in person. And you might have noticed that we, uh, our drinks and our food was all from the region tonight. We had some craft beers and, and some, uh, we had some mass, well, actually, in this little uh, parcel, which I'm going to present to um, oh, Reggie with appreciation, you. we have some mass and rangers, some fruit produce, we have some Bendigo. Uh, crunch, really nice, really, really nice, <laughs> and, uh, and some Mount Alexander uh, produce as well. So we're, we're so sharing much. the love across the region. And of course, for you too, Jenny. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you know, you. You've put a lot of work in thought into uh, this discussion. And Startup Centre Victoria throughout the next two years, and we've been doing it the past um, uh, two years, is very much about having conversations with real people that are out there doing it as well as some of the um, actual processes and our pre-accelerator program that starts in July might be of interest to those that have a startup idea to go through when you're asking about funding, uh, when it's a very hot topic and, and it was a great answer. Uh, there's lots of options, but you need to think through that. But all those other um, uh, things that startups have to think of. It's um, in a global sense. So stay tuned for that. But every month there will be an online meetup. Michael's here tonight. He was our guest last month uh, talking about how he started up his business in the region. And each uh, month we will have someone new to talk to around the region as well as some in person. Now, I'm very excited. Steph and Marcus have organised the next in-person meetup, 22nd of March, the Bendigo Developer Group. It's actually on Startup Centre Victoria website now as an event with the link, and that will be at Square V with uh, another favourite person of ours, um, two of them actually, Vicky and Stephen. So a great opportunity to see another fast-growing tech 
company here in the region. So we'll keep sharing the ideas, sharing the discussions, and basically we're here as a resource to you. And if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, go to our, um, our website, or there's a QR code there, and, um, and please make sure you're getting the updates so that you're tuned in to what's happening. And if you have a need, let us know. We will have mentors and we can organise speakers um, as the need arises. But thank you so much. A great start to 2023. And thank you to Clear Dynamics for hosting our very first in-person for the year. Thank you. Grab another drink and more food, people. You don't have to go straight away.